Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to Revising the Imagination, an author panel on queer fantasy fiction. This panel is presented by the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Program, the Literature Program, the Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Pitt Queer Professionals, and the University Store on Fifth at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we are very grateful for all of the people who uh, supported this panel today. My name is Dr. Julie Bullier, and today we are celebrating the stories of Kay Ankrum, Dr. Nairi Bakalian, Andrew Eliopoulos, Brian Olson, and Rebecca Kim Wells. These five fiction authors are infusing the fantasy genre uh, with LGBTQA plus characters. Faced with powerful creatures, magical possibilities, and time travel woes, these new queer heroes emerge triumphant as role models for readers of all ages. Books by today's panelists are available at the University Store at Fifth. Please check them out at the link in the chat or uh, the video description. So today is a pit day of giving, and another way you can support queer and diverse representation is by do donating to the LGBTQA plus research and outreach fund. This is an endowed fund. Working with gender and sexuality and women's studies and pit queer professionals, we launched this fund to create opportunities for students to pursue LGBTQA plus research and scholarship. After last year's uh, pit day of giving, we were able to endow the fund to make lasting impact and we hope to award our first scholarship soon. Any amount you can contribute will help to further the, uh, the fund's capacity to assist and encourage students in this research area. If you would like to donate or learn more about the LGBTQA plus uh, research and outreach fund, uh, you can find a link to the Pit Day of Giving campaign page in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube description below. And now I am excited to introduce our authors. Our first author is uh, Kayla Ankrum. Kayla Ankrum is the author of The Wicker King. Second author is Dr. Nairi Bakalian, author of Grey Dawn. Andrew, uh, Andrew Eliopoulos, author of The Fascinators, is here with us today. Brian Olson, who is the author of The Sudden World. We also have with us today, Rebecca Kim Wells, author of Shatter the Sky. So we welcome all of our panelists and we have a set of uh, exciting questions for them all. And we're gonna start the conversation now. And again, we will be posting links so you can browse these titles and other books by our panelists. So hello authors, I'm gonna stop sharing our screen now so that we can see your faces a little bit better. Thank you all for being here. So let's dive into some of the first questions uh, from, for the panel. So mythological creatures, such as fairies, unicorn, unicorns, mermaids, and vampires are often associated with divergent bodies and sexualities. Which fantasy creatures influenced your thinking about queerness? And which, que que uh, which creatures appear in your books? And so some of these are directed towards specific authors, but I'm really excited to hear uh, anyone's voice on this question. Hi, uh, good morning. It's still a little early for me just because I'm a night owl. Um, so uh, I'm Rebecca Kim Wells. I'm the author of the Shatter the Sky duology, which if you're not familiar, um, it is about a girl named Marin whose girlfriend is abducted from her home and she decides that in order to get her back, she's going to steal a dragon from the evil empire and burn everything down pretty much. So um, dragons are the main character, uh, main creature that appears in that duology. And then I have a new book coming out in November that has a sort of different sort of dragon and then also mermaids. And I thought that was a very interesting question because I actually didn't really think about the <laughs> connections between fantasy creatures and queerness and divergent bodies when I was writing it. I sort of came into the genre like as a person obsessed with fantasy novels when I was a kid before I really started thinking about my own queerness and um, the queerness of my characters. So, you know, why do fantastical creatures appear in my work? 
because I'm a fantasy author. Um, but the more I started thinking about it, I was like, this is a really interesting like connection. Um, I read recently a, um, an article, which I wrote down, um, Horns, Feathers, and Scales, Reclaiming Genderqueer Monstrousness. Uh, the author, Tessa Grattan, wrote it for Tor.com. And I thought that was a really fascinating article about um, basically, you know, a gender queerness and feeling othered and obsession with monsters and how those things are like connected for Tessa in an interesting way. Um, I'd love to hear what other panelists have to say about this. I have to confess that, you know, until this question was posed to me, I honestly hadn't thought very much about it. But now I'm like, you know, there's probably something there in my own work. Yeah, I also found the question really interesting and I hadn't thought about it in that way before. Um, I had never thought of a, a specific type of magical creature uh, inspiring or relating to queerness directly in that way, although I'm sure a lot of authors do. Um, I know that I try to, uh, uh, the Sun World, the Yesterday's Magic series has a lot of magical, different types of magical creatures in it. And I try to look at them as um, just as queer as my humans are, or that's how I try to write them. Um, all the intelligent magical creatures, I try to look at them like people so that I try to get away from the idea that this particular type of magical creature is evil or this particular type is good and try to look at them as individuals. Um, and so as individuals, they're as diversely queer as the human characters are. Um, so yeah, so I was trying to think about this question. I don't know that I look at any individual like, you know, vampires or sexy queer, um, which I think is great and perfectly valid if some authors uh, look at them that way. But for me, it was, I never looked at that framework. So um, uh, less a uh, mythological creature and more of just a general supernatural being. Uh, in my book, Grey Dawn, uh, the main character, uh, who's a trans woman, um, the catalyst for her finally deciding to leave the army and transition is coming face to face with one of her gods, who is uh, Takemi Nakata no Kami, one of the gods in the Shinto pantheon. And, you know, it takes... I think, you know, for my part, and and I think quite a few other trans folk out there might, might this might resonate with, sometimes it feels like it takes, damn near takes divine inter intervention to get you to kind of go, okay, these are the things I need to cut loose from. These are the things that are no longer acceptable. Everything is falling apart around me. I need to take a leap of faith. So in Grey Dawn, Takemi Nakata in a battlefield in Syria, comes face to face with my main character right when she's convinced that she's about to die unseen and un unheard as her as who she really is and he says trust me and let go and so being roused to action by the supernatural is i think something that has um has uh, really uh uh, figured into how I how I write my characters. Um, in a in in future work, I'm also interested in uh, because there's I'm going to be doing a sequel, as some are already aware. Um, uh, I'm also interested in bringing in a, a mythological creature from Northern Honshu called the Namahage, who are sort of looking like uh, ogre-like, long, furry ogre-like uh, beings who are fearsome, but whose uh, goal is to move people to uh, action, again, to, to, uh, to prompt better behavior and diligence and good relations in a, in a community. Um, but they look, they kind of, they kind of shake people out of complacency because, oh my goodness, this creature with horns and a spear is telling me to shape up. Um, so, so I'm, I'm excited to, I'm excited to explore that, but that's, that's in future work. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. 
I would love to talk about it. Um, my, I think my experience with um, like supernatural creatures and um, LGBT identity is more weighted on the perspective of being a reader. And I believe the first time that I truly felt seen in that regard was when I was kind of immersing myself in Arthurian culture and I was introduced to the concept of Merlin. And Merlin is a Cambian, which is a creature that is a child of an incubus or succubus and a human. And I felt incredibly seen by him, not only because he's like a chaotic bisexual, but also because he has this like inherent tragicness about him because he has the ability to basically like craft his own world to his will around him, but also the, um, I guess, backslide of being what he is, is the, I guess, punishment of aging backwards. So being chronically lonely, being chronically isolated, unable to relate to the people who want to be close to him. Um, and kind of like in this world of private godhood, not a godhood that shares with others um, and dealing with the weight of that really felt incredibly intimate to me as a 13 year old reading The Once and Future King. So, um, so yeah, so I, I really, you know, whenever I think about like supernatural and that I always kind of like, I'm attracted to the characters that embody those um, aspects. And I'm fully aware that, you know, feeling that like isolation being forced to create found family, um, having the ways that you are sexually be something that people can't really understand, even if they are accepting, is a interpretation of my orientation and the orientation of people of my love through the view of, um, through the lens of trauma. So hopefully the younger people who are able to read the work that we are created, which most of which was created in a vacuum of nothing like it before like 2005 or so, no longer have to relate to supernatural creatures in that way and can, kind of enjoy a perspective kind of closer to um, Rebecca Kim Wells and Brian Olson's in which they're free to ascribe, you know, whatever to whichever creatures they like. I feel like you've just single-handedly made me need to read Once in Future King. So good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think just to follow up on what you said, because I, I think that's really great. Um, just thinking about it. Um, the idea that we, because because I'm realizing as you said that as a, as a reader as a kid, I too I did look to um, mythological creatures who were framed as outsiders, and I saw a part of myself in them. Um, and I think it's great that now, um, while that can still be there, we uh, can make what we had to find for ourselves in the subtext. We can make it text now. Yeah, and, and I would say that's exactly where I'm coming from in my book. And I wasn't going to speak on this question at first because um, in my book, The Fascinators, which is set in a world where everyone can do magic to some degree, um, therefore the main characters, Sam and his best friends, James and Delia in this small town in Georgia, don't come off as creatures as such. You know, I wanted very much to explore that line between the magical and the mundane. Um, I love the Crestomancy Chronicles by Diana Wynne Jones growing up and A Wizard of Earthsea, I very much wanted to do my magic school. And so when you were first asking about creatures, I was thinking, okay, I'm the book with, without creatures in them. But hearing Rebecca talk, I mean, um, there was another article on tour.com that why author Dahlia Adler wrote called Season of the Witch in which she explores the way that, that a number of queer fantasies that sort of reclaim witches and wizards now um, are, are positing witches and wizards as, as people who um, you know, derive their power from that which makes them other. And that was very much what happened in The Fascinators. I found even after I'd made this world where everyone could do magic to some degree, I couldn't tell the story I wanted to tell without setting it in a small town in Georgia where the three main characters would still be a little bit on the fringes um, because they're in a religious community where most people are distrustful of what magic can do because they think it rivals um, what religion is meant to do for them. So. You know, I, I tried to make it a, oh, I'll make it the status quo in this world. And yet, you know, by virtue of making the main character gay and, and, and having other queer characters, I just could not tell the story about witches and wizards that I wanted to tell without exploring the ways that they were othered still. I feel like that's such a central part of so many queer people's experiences in the real world that sometimes it's really difficult to separate 
like queerness from feeling othered and that's something that I've like you know I still struggle with I'm like okay am I feeling this way because queer or am I feeling this way because of the 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 limitations that the world around me places upon me Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Um, many of you actually noted in your response to that some early experiences with reading, right? So as a young adult. So the next question really uh, addresses how to write for diverse audiences and here thinking about how to write uh, gender and sexuality texts or write gender and sexuality into your text for young, adult, uh, young audiences. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. All right, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, so I think that a lot of the time, um, kind of like across the board, how you process um, the way that you're going to approach this is really like kind of generational because I know what was available to me when I was younger and I know some of the newer authors, what was available to them and then some of our like predecessors, what was available to them and how we all process that and how we're going to present certain things to, to people. And I, I was born in 1991, so I'm 29. And I'm from an era where we had like books about LGBT um, people, but they were all issue books and they were all really, really sad and really, really like kind of like emotionally violent. And they were, you know, designed to showcase um, that people who were different deserve sympathy and empathy and understanding and that they're living like rich and often terrible experiences, which was very valuable at the time. Like in 2001, like we needed that. Whereas like now I, I came up during a, a period where we were kind of doing that thing where we're like, oh, we're gonna try to not write issue books. We're gonna write about, you know, queer joy and, you know, adventure stories where their identity has nothing to do with what's happening because we want these kids to have books that aren't about being sad, aren't about, you know, wishing that they were, were you know, like everybody else. We're going to make a book where they um, are gay, but that's not important because their house is full of ghosts. And <laughs> that's way more important than that because that's a pressing issue that needs to be taken care of. So um, my work kind of like reflects that um, perspective. And I think that, um, Sorry, my computer started dying. Anyway, <laughs> I think that uh, it's very like indicative of that. Whereas like a lot of the times, um, some of the newer books that I'm reading are very much written to both embody an understanding of, you know, orientation and what that means to that person. And then using that understanding to kind of explore the environment that they're, that they're in. And it's very clearly from an academic perspective, a leap in the like kind of like, uh, I guess LGBT discourse that has shown itself in the work that we are creating. Well, I think that, you know, queer people have always been writing. And so there have been books by queer people about queer people for a long time. But I think that what's shifted in the last while has been a perspective of publishing from being, okay, we're writing about queer people to a lot of people writing for queer people. Um, and I think that's so important. Um, you know, writing for young people as many of us do, I personally am more interested in making sure that young queer readers feel seen and feel like, you know, they can have all of the opportunities and adventures that everyone else has in a, a safe environment of like exploring it in a book instead of, you know, not um, having you know, the real world, which is not always safe for, for queer children. Um, I also think it's really important for straight children to read about people who are not like them because you know that's the way that you learn and you broaden your horizons and you come to understand you know not that queer people queer, queer children are like lessons for straight children but just like you know you need to understand that the world around you is not just you and your direct experience and so i think it's so important to write for children in general and queer children specifically Thank you so much gratitude for uh, both of you in, in those responses and everybody who is writing great fiction that is you know, diverse for young folks. Um, 
Yeah, it makes me think about, you know, the fact that, that you know, the sort of hardship narrative that we think of as, you know, very persuasive, but we also need narratives of, of acceptance, right? And being able to see, yeah, I don't know. Larry, did you want to? You uh, want to yeah, I, this is, this is, this is, I, I really, I, I, I very much resonate with all of this because um, what prompted me to get started with writing with publication in mind was, you know, having been trained as an academic, my my usual writing output was sort of pointing in one direction. But as a consumer of sci-fi, you know, I remember, I remember the night actually that I I I the, the switch flipped. I I was what so I, I was raised on stuff like Star Trek, and then I had this night right after I right after I came out at work in 2013, where I thought, how long is it going to be until I see someone like me in a show like this? why don't I start writing it rather than wait for the, rather than wait for a big studio to do, to do something about this. Why don't I start writing it? So I started writing and uh, you know, here I am multiple short stories and a book later. And, you know, um, the other thing that I write with in mind is uh, so when I came out, right, right before I came out, the thing that helped me find the courage to come out and see, okay, there are people like me out there in the world doing more or less what I, you know, are sort of vaguely in my discipline or in my line of work, and they made it work, was transition memoirs. Um, and that's a genre of writing that has its place. But not everybody is going to be reading a memoir or going to be interested in a memoir. So why don't I write the stories where people can see themselves? So now, nowadays, I like to think that I'm writing for the closeted, scared girl I used to be, so that she can so that she can make that leap of faith and doesn't have to necessarily rely on a memoir written by someone like 20 years older than her. Um, so. I, I think a lot about that and about what um, Kay was talking about, the idea of those types of memoirs or, or you know, fictionalized versions of them, these um, coming out stories or struggle stories, um, because I too, you know, grew up earlier than the 90s. Um, and that was, that was what was available and it was very important for me. Um, but, you know, well, in the 70s and 80s, they, particularly they tended to be fairly, you know, they tended to have fairly tragic endings. Um, so I, I try to walk that line um, now in my writing uh, of, I think there's still a, a great a place, there's always gonna be a need for coming out stories, um, but that's not what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm more interested in like what Nairi was talking about in, in putting out stories um, that tell queer experiences um, where being queer is not the conflict for any of the characters, but being queer is central to those characters. Um, so that's the line that I, I try to uh, walk in my writing. I, I like to say that, you know, yeah, my main character is trans, but she's also right-handed, a caffeine addict, and has strong opinions about uh, early 21st century punk music. You know, this is just one thing among many. <laughs> It's it's so funny. I mean, I, I I loved the 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 title of this panel when I was invited. This revising the imagination um, because for me coming up with the fascinators, I very much set out to write the kind of story that that I hear Brian describing, or or you know I, I wanted it to be that this character Sam who is in love with his best friend, um, but it's complicated because he doesn't know whether his best friend is queer. He knows that you know over the years they've accumulated a lot of moments where it seems like maybe he's flirting back. And they're supposed to be roommates in college, and what does that mean? Um, and this was a you know experience that was very familiar to me growing up in Georgia. Um, so I knew I wanted to write about that experience, and then the magic just kept sort of seeping in because that's what I'd grown up reading. I'd grown up reading fantasy, and it was impossible to write a story without going in that direction somehow. But as I was writing it, I found that it was so hard to say, okay, if the homophobia in this place is not the villain, because I would love to write that that you know you know queerness is incidental. I'd love to write that story. I'd love to write that story where the queerness isn't part of the conflict. And I kept trying to do it. And I found that I was really hitting these roadblocks where it was like, what is the conflict? You know, how am, <laughs> what is the story I'm writing where these characters are not just in coffee shops talking about their feelings? Um, because, you know, the, the kind of fantasy that I wanted to write and the kind of queer experience that I wanted to write were not meshing easily in the drafting of this book, to be honest. And, and it took a lot of 
personal, you know, growth for me to be able to write the book and to be able to imagine a character like I was into a story like the kind of story that I wanted to write and, and what that conflict should look like if it wasn't going to be queerness. So it was in the process of writing this book that I was able to sort of imagine, okay, what might a conflict look like if it's, if it's not the fact that he's gay in a small town. Um, and I just realized that because I hadn't seen those stories, the, they had never factored into the stories I'd read growing up, I couldn't imagine what it looked like until I was actually doing it. Um, so digressive, but <laughs> just love everything that you're saying. I just you know wanted to add, I set out to do the kind of things you're all describing and it ended up being a lot harder than I thought it, it would be. Um, yeah, that's fair, and and I appreciate that. I think that there's a there we uh, a lot of these questions are also directly related to method. I know that we have a lot of artists and writers um, here joining us today, so I think it's exciting to hear all of those comments about the struggle of writing as well. Um, yeah, so well, we can move to another question. Uh, some of some of our uh, more influential fantasy authors are have later been revealed to be. Um, very hateful and to have hateful views. Um, some of us are familiar with H.P. Lovecraft's racism, um, Road Dahl's anti-Semitism, uh, or J.K. Rowling's uh, transphobia and, and trans violence and trans hatred, trans speech, trans hate speech. So how do you feel when you hear about these controversies? How have you managed these, um, you know, these kind of canonical figures? Um, and uh, um, yeah, what do you have to say about that question? Tired, uh, just very tired. Um, you know, I I feel like, you know, when stuff like this comes out, and and stuff like this does come out, I think more th these days than it used to because of the extreme like public nature of the internet and the way we live our lives now. Um, there's a sort of like reflexive defensiveness that a lot of people get because they're like oh but I really loved like this work I so connected with this I saw myself in this like how can you tell me that I have to like throw it all in the garbage because the author is terrible um and I feel like I totally understand that reaction but I feel like what a lot of people don't quite get to is like look you know, the views of the author, you know, notwithstanding, a lot of what the book gives to you is what you bring to the reading experience personally. And so I'm not going to ding anyone who loves Harry Potter, but I will say that it's kind of unavoidable to, to not be aware of this right now. So like I personally, you know, I loved Harry Potter when I was growing up. I still have the books. I may reread them at some point, but I now know to read them with this understanding in mind, and I would not recommend them to other people because of that. But that doesn't take away the value that I saw in them, you know, when I was reading them growing up. So I don't know. It's complicated. It's very tiring. <laughs> Appreciate that. Does anybody else want to take on this question? I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, it was really challenging and heartbreaking last year, you know, as someone who grew up reading Harry Potter and who felt like, you know, my love for those books growing up had propelled me into working in publishing for a while, um, into being a fantasy writer. And I think for me, the one thing I would add is that I found myself going back through a lot and cycling back to, to ask myself what you know, implicit biases in those books might have come through and informed the kind of fantasy stories that that come like second nature to me. Um, you know, and it's kind of like what I was saying in the previous question where having wanting to write my own magic school story, um, you know, set in Georgia with a gay character and, and realizing that, like, just wanting to write the kind of magic school story I wanted to write and just adding a gay character into it didn't mesh as easily as I would have liked. And, um, you know, when I went and when I look back at Harry Potter now, I think, you know, of all of these, all these moments that felt like, like positive crumbs when I was growing up, like, oh, the revelation that Dumbledore is gay, we're going to, you know, off page and we're going to hear about it at any moment. It's finally going to come out. Um, and now looking back at those moments and, and thinking, you know, 
these were the products of an imagination that 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 I so strongly disagree with and 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 have a hard time even believing that this could have come from this writer and what other things that I miss in this work um, that are a product of coming from a writer like that and and you know what what things do I need to question that were in the text um, and not just in the writer's politics outside of the book so it was a it was a big um, destabilizing moment last year to realize that I needed to look back at these books through a totally different lens and see what I might have missed that was kind of sneaking through or seeping through in the stories that I might not have examined as closely as I should have because I just was taking it on trust that you know this was a world where we were all working together and good over evil and all of these great you know rah rah things like um, it was it was a big moment of reckoning I think for me last year um, with going back to the text. This is one of those moments where I, I feel like my, uh, my tendency to not read the stuff that everybody else sort of takes as a given may be a little bit of a blessing. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's kind of anathema for an author. Like you're supposed to, the, the, the given wisdom, the, you know, the, the, the common wisdom is that in order to be a good author, you have to read a lot of fiction. Well, I don't read very much fiction. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, that's, that's sort of not where I draw my, most of my pool of inspiration. You know, I watch some stuff on TV. I have, you know, some, some uh, 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 preferred uh, media, but these days I feel like because because I you know uh, uh, struggling to make a living ever since I graduated from Pitt um, uh, has has so particularly so sapped my energy and my time. Um, uh, I want to be like judicious about where I invest my where I invest my attention, where I invest my money. But even before that, I just feel like it never really these like the Rollings and the and the dolls and so on uh, never really never really interested me. Um, but that being said, it's interesting to observe this you know the the fallout of these things uh, as a sort of quasi outsider um, and think okay you know. How can I how can I be better about questioning my implicit biases and being more circumspect about uh, the things that the shortcomings that I have to own up to and correct for, um, and also just as a as an example of something that a shortcoming in one of these authors that actually has inspired me to go the extra mile and do better, looking at how. Uh, Rowling has uh, done some very slipshod world building on Japanese wizarding in particular. As someone who's trained in Japanese history, I just, you know, she's gone to, she like has this slipshod world building of, oh yes, we have this, they have this school that's called Mahotokoro Magic Place. And it has nothing to do with Japanese sorcery at all. And I'm just sitting there going, Oh, for goodness sakes, there was a Japanese Ministry of Magic in the Imperial government until 1873. <laughs> you, <laughs> it was right there. Um, so, uh, you know, I feel like that, that, that as an author, you know, who wants to, who, who partly deals in, uh, you know, works in East Asian settings, I just think that, okay, Okay, I'm a historian and I'm a fiction author and this big name author, you know, on top of the transphobia and, the, and all of that stuff has also, has also been really slipshod and kind of racist. Um, but there's this, there's this setting that's been unexplored by, to my knowledge, by pretty much anybody in English. How can I, like, while doing all the homework that I need to be doing, write a you know, a badass, well-written, well-researched, uh, you should see my bibliography at the end of Grey Dawn, um, <laughs> um, story that uh, can, you know, blow it out of the water, so to speak. Um, you know, it's like, so where they fall short, I feel like, um, you know, for the rest of us, there's an opportunity to step in and step up. Yeah, um, the examples that you gave, um, of her shoddy and tone deaf world building in a lot of ways definitely ties in, I think, to her transphobia and in particular to her reaction to 
uh, people confronting her about that, which is that she's just clearly not listening, not interested in listening, and simply just continues to double down. Um, so from, from that, and uh, a hard one for me was uh, Orson Scott Card and his uh, virulent, uh, uh, cruel homophobia, um, which really, the, the I know Ender's Game is what everybody loves. For me, it was the tales of Alvin Maker, which really meant a lot to me as a teenager. Um, and him too, simply confronted, when confronted with it, simply doubled down and just didn't listen and never chose to learn. Um, so I, uh, like, sort of like what you said, I, I, I try to um, make sure that I'm, you know, that I'm listening. And I think it's important for everybody, right, to, to uh, if you do fall short, which we all will at some point or another, to listen to our critics um, and to not, and it's an, a human reaction to feel defensive, but to recognize that defensiveness and understand that you need to let that go. Um, and listen and learn um, and because and it, it's only going to make you a better person and it's only going to make your writing better. And it's sad that people like Rowling uh, aren't capable of that. I think um, I too grew up with um, President Scott Card uh, as being my introductory experience to this issue and also S.E. Hinton. Um, that was also incredibly devastating, but I had those experiences when I was very young, I think hmm, maybe like right after middle school of being like, oh my God, this, you know, this is so terrible that I thought that this was something that was designed for people like me to consume, but was not. So that when a majority of the issues that are happening like right now happened, I was at a point where I wasn't really able to feel like kind of like anger or sadness or betrayal. I just felt bored and they just looked pathetic to me and like I can't like emotion they don't deserve my rage my emotional engagement it's just like oh gross you wrote that you spent all your, your time doing that you whatever like that's how I experience learning about JK Rowling and I'm much more interested in the like concept of them creating dangerous propaganda because that's what that is and you know disseminating this dangerous propaganda that influences what you know growing children are thinking about their peers which is a problem and, you know, talking to other people about how that's like a main issue and that how as a writer for children, it's our responsibility to create the work that we make with care and with respect and with an understanding that we are writing, not just for, you know, this year and our debut and whatever, we are writing books that will last for generations. There are books that I read back, you know, that came from like the 1930s when I was grasping for, you know, queer representation before, majority of that was kind of like suppressed um, and making sure that we have like that understanding within ourselves that even though we're writing our own experiences and our own traumas and you know our own um, legends we're creating work that will outlast us and that these people are pathetic because they did not consider that and because they did not put the work in that they should because it is their job and that's the way I feel about those people. But I also think that an, an integral part of understanding why we feel the way we do when these things happen, that tragedy, that mourning, that, you know, the sadness, we're not necessarily mourning them, we're mourning ourselves. We placed something that they built into our identity and we are mourning having to A, remove it and B, more critically analyze it. It's like watching a television show that you loved as a kid and then realizing that the dialogue is bad and the pacing is weird. Like it's, it's inherently disappointing, but we're not disappointed for them. And also divorcing the concept of like viewing authors as people who are like kind of like celebrities, like celebrities of our heart, not necessarily celebrities of the world, I guess. When they're celebrities of our heart, we see them as somebody who's inherently like above us, who is inherently something we learn learn from, that we gather what they can give to us from where they're sitting. And authors are people, they're fallible people. Orson Scott Card is annoying. I met him, he's annoying. And like, you know, it's when you, when you understand that these are people that they're fallible and they have their own prejudices, they have their own, you know, perspectives about things, they have their own viewpoints and stuff like that. Like your ability to understand that JK Rowling writing, you know, even the most tangential prejudice things like her weird house elf thing and the stuff she feels about, you know, just even the small stuff, it's just like 
so this is what you are and this is what you've built and this is all you are capable of giving. That's how I feel about these situations. So powerful. I think so important to think about, you know, the, the ethics of it all, right? Which is what I hear in that thinking about like this needs to outlast and be accountable for, you know, years to come and, you know, folks not having that in the past. And uh, also really grateful that so many of these responses were, you know, in the spirit of, of our own self-reflexivity instead of just, you know, thinking about what we could say that was terrible about other people, which is just the better answer. And I'm just so grateful for that, right? It's just... Um, are yeah no, noteworthy so thank you um next question okay so many of us grew up dreaming of being whisked away to a secret school for magic only later to realize that that magical private school was not diverse or inclusive is there a better way for magic to inspire students um I think this question might be about the fascinators but obviously open to all kinds of folks responses yeah, and I'm, excuse me, I'm still sort of marinating and processing and, and, and loving what Kayla said about what we're, you know, what we're mourning in when we're, when we're mourning um, this revelation, it's a, something that, something about ourselves. And I think that was exactly it for me. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's funny to sort of um, combine a couple of things that I've been saying, this process of trying to write my book happened before this reckoning with, with with J.K. Rowling last year, um, you know, this book was was a few years in the making, but I think it was coming up against the fact that why does this magic school that that I so often went to for a source of escape as a reader growing up, why do, why isn't it fitting? Why doesn't it feel right as I'm trying to write it now with a gay main character? Um, you know, just to give a concrete example of how this book changed when I when I was first writing it, it very much was this you know arts magnet school where you could major in magic and. It was, it was very much trying to replicate the magic school um, that I had read and, and that I had always wanted to belong in, exactly as, as you said in, in your question, and then realizing that, that as we were talking about earlier, to write a gay character into that, um, you know, it was like I didn't have the imagination. Again, this is why I love the, the title of this panel. I, I, I found that I had not been able to imagine myself in that kind of setting when I tried to do it. And so the story took this completely different shape and different direction. Um, and, and I do think, you know, I take that responsibility that Kayla was mentioning about writing for, for young readers so seriously and, 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 and tried to find, you know, that space. Um, the main character, you, you see his support groups outside of, outside of, you know, studying magic at school. You see that he has a queer center in Atlanta that, that is very important to him and that he has to grapple with the fact that like, here are my friends who do magic with me. Here are my fellow LGBTQIA friends who understand a different piece of me, um, you know, and here's how my parents are supporting me. Um, you know, I, it was very important for me in the book to locate all the different places where the main character goes for support because it wasn't always gonna come from that magic school. And that was something that I realized in trying to write it. Um, so yeah, I, ju I just, you know, sort of, I don't know if it's a definitive answer to that question, but speaking to the fact that as I tried to explore, why doesn't this magic school setting feel like it encompasses what I want it to do? Where else do I have to go in the story to find that source of support? Um, is very much, you know, something I had to learn in my own life as in, as in this book. I think that um, in, as far as magic schools go and like systems of magic in general in fiction, the only limitations are the imagination of the author and the priorities of the author, in my opinion. So I think that, you know, that's a big part of the reason why a lot of like magic school narratives that that we might have read, you know, 20 years ago feel very, you know, white, straight, cis, um, because many of those authors like just didn't have the scope of imagination to do that. And they weren't especially concerned with doing that. So, you know, I, I think it is important to, to represent systems of magic better now. And that's something that I wouldn't necessarily blame people in the past for not being able to do, but I think, you know, it's, it's a priority for us now. And if you can, you should. And not being able to re represent that is not like a 
personal failing, I would say, but it's, you know, it's perhaps like a little bit of a craft failing a little bit if you're not like recognizing, okay, these are my personal limitations. Let me try to push my craft and be better at doing this. I think um, the overall like concept of magic is, is interesting to discuss and like how, how it arrives in our work. But I've always believed that magic is a conduit designed within our Western dogma as a narrative tool to give power to the powerless. Um, it generally is a great equalizer. I think that a lot of, and I'm specific, specifically with like Western, yeah, okay, you know, but, um, but anyway, um, it's, it's framed as a great equalizer. It's children being able to go toe to toe with adults through use of magic. It's, you know, women being able to, um, do what they need to get done to upend, you know, power structures that have been created for them. Um, it's poor people having the ability to effectively and efficiently rise up against you know people who are oppressing them um and a lot of this is it's not like you know heavy-handed direct comparison like in harry potter since we're talking about that um it's not discussed as being a great equalizer but it is the great equalizer between all of the people who are available it is the great equalizer between you know the poor characters and the rich characters it is the great equalizer between the children and the adults it's a great equalizer between the characters who are outsiders like werewolves or whatever and the characters who are the gentry and speaking of the gentry um while we're talking about dark academia and magic schools as a concept that's actually just a fantasy of the gentry like we're all fantasizing about being able to go to boarding school. <laughs> like when you like actually walk in those spaces and, you know, I guess rub elbows with those people, you realize that a lot of the things that we're having to create magic to equalize for the rest of us are things that are just casual aspects of their lives. Like the, actually only earlier this year did I realize that like having balls, like with the giant dresses and stuff like that, like they're still doing that. And like, they're still having these huge like parties in Vienna that are exactly like, freaking cinderella and none of us really have access to that and we completely think that that's over but that's still their lives and we're fantasizing about a power tool and when you think about magic as a power tool your ability to kind of understand how to use it to create a narrative that you know furthers whatever you know plotline storyline that you've created it's a lot easier to kind of like um think about how how you can enrich your own metaphors with the understanding of the magic structures that you're creating. And I'd like to, again, like for this in regards to, um, this is specifically a Western perspective because like in Eastern culture and in island culture, because that's where I'm from, <laughs> magic is like a little bit different and what it means in regards to like, it's I think at least in, in island culture is about identity as opposed to power. Um, but when you're writing like from Western perspectives you're writing about like Western, you know, um, perspective, a lot of it is about power and people who are reading it, whether they know it or not, are going to expect to understand the power structure that magic lends to the universe that you created. That was incredibly exciting to learn from you about that perspective. Thank you, I appreciate that so much. Um, yeah, so it makes me wanna be a magician. So here though, um, the, uh, we will move on unless other folks wanna comment on that, we good? Similar question actually. So kind of thinking about um, your approach to creating diverse or intersectional worlds or landscapes or texts, uh, what methods you've taken to do that? Do you have a strategy for writing outside of your own experience? This question is really open to anyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I do think it's, I consider it a, 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 both a, a personal responsibility to write uh, diverse and intersectional and inclusive work. Um, but also it's it's easy because that's what I, I want to do and that that represents my my world and it represents the world that I want to see. Um, it would certainly be very easy to just populate my main characters with gay, white, cis men like me, um, but that's not very interesting. <laughs> um, and also going back a little bit to our earlier conversation about authors like Rowling or Orson Scott Card, um, I, I find myself very wary now when I read an author um, 
when I read a book that is not inclusive, I worry that you know, I'm going to, I don't want to fall too much in love with it because I'm worried I'm going to find out something awful uh, about the author. Um, and I want to make sure that my readers um, feel included, not just included in my work, but, uh, that they can see, my, see themselves in my worlds and that they can see themselves as main characters in my worlds, um, no matter who they are. Um, so writing, so I, I consider it very important to write uh, main characters who are different from myself. Um, and I have, you know, and that's not always easy and it requires uh, work, it requires craft, it requires research, it requires talking to people. Um, to understand experiences different from your own so that when you portray them, people who, who that is a part of their lived experiences, uh, it's important that it rings true for them and doesn't take them out of that narrative, if that makes sense. You have a couple of people in the chat box looking for uh, looking for Kayla too. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Um, so I think that, that when we talk about like writing from perspectives that aren't our perspective in general, it's important to kind of bring the topic of authenticity readers into the discussion because I think that you know that's something that wasn't necessarily available isn't a great word, but close to it um, for a lot of our predecessors. Whereas for us, there's kind of a little bit more of an industry of availability. And um, there weren't any available at all for my first book. Um, but for the book that I have coming out in um, June of this year, Darling, I really wanted to put a lot of emphasis on um, like some perspectives that weren't mine, namely um, Russian uh, immigrant, Korean American, um, deaf and hard of hearing, uh, I have some drag queens in the story as well. And uh, most importantly, an indigenous character that I added to replace the uh, Tiger Lily character, which is a racist character. And like, I, I create these ensemble casts and I want them to be diverse. And I can't, you know, to the best of my ability, be able to look up how best to write these characters because being a part of an outs, like being an outsider to a community means that even though you are able to do research, you can't know exactly which research is the best research in order to make sure that you avoid certain things. Like for example, you could read something that's written, actually what I did was um, I read something that was written about the specific tribe that I was writing about, not knowing that it was written by a tribe that has had like um, conflict with them. So it was like super racist, but like internally racist. So it's like indigenous versus indigenous. <laughs> problems. But I'm somebody who's not from the background. So how could I have known that that was a thing? So um, I actually, in my work, when I'm writing perspectives that are not from my own, I do what I call um, placer content. So I'll write something and I'll write dialogue and then I'll flag all of the dialogue. And then when I, um, when we hire a authenticity reader to write it, I tell them, if you would like to rewrite the dialogue of this book, we can have you rewrite the dialogue and I will put that you rewrote that, that you wrote the dialogue of this book in my acknowledgements. Because I don't necessarily think that um, my perspective, if it is something that makes the story more interesting, I guess, is has more value than somebody who is reading something from their own perspective, while at the same time believing that it's a goal that is it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult to hit to be able to write everybody's perspective with the peak ability to not necessarily write something that is damaging. I had never heard of, of that before, the rewriting dialogue, and that makes so much sense to me. And I'm like, whoa, you can do that. <laughs> and of course you can do that. I just like had never like thought of it before. Um, I have yet to write a book set in the the real world or you know our current world um, but that doesn't make it um, less important to be writing like inclusively and diversely diversely even in fantasy worlds but I just wanted to uh, chime in about I am a Korean American and I have I have an idea a very nascent idea of a book that touches on that but I also like I was born in the U.S. I've never been to Korea and I've been doing a ton of research about Korea and I had been planning to visit Korea of course that's not really possible right now um, but speaking to uh, Kayla's point about um, 
vetting your sources. Um, I had picked up a book um, about someone who had visited Korea and they were writing about, um, you know, like their, their travelogue basically. And I'm reading it and I'm reading it. And all of a sudden I'm like, wow, like this is very like exoticizing of Korean women. And I looked to the back and this was a book that had been you know, like well recommended by by the general public about like, oh, look at this cool book about Korea. And I looked to the back and I'm like, okay, you're a white man writing about Korea, which isn't itself like automatically like, oh, this is a terrible source. But the second I read like this description that he wrote about these Korean women he met, I was like, oh shit, I have to throw this book in the trash because this is just like so obvious that you are not being responsible that, that your perspective is off basically and therefore I can't trust anything else that you said about this topic so that was sad but happens a lot and so it's important to you know not just read about a subject but also interrogate uh, who has created the resource and why and it's important to think about too um what stories um, I hesitate to use the phrase of what stories aren't yours to tell, but maybe what stories maybe are better told by somebody else. Um, I have a, uh, um, in, in Yesterday's Magic, the, the series, my most recent series, um, one of the three main characters is trans. And uh, it's set when they're teenagers, um, they're all 17. And uh, it was, and the book is about identity. Like that's a major theme for all of the characters in the book across the series. Uh, but it was important for me. I, I felt like I, I'm not going to tell a trans coming out story, even though, you know, a 17 year old grappling with identity, that would be a core part of this major character story potentially. But I wasn't going to do that because I don't feel like that's my, my, my story to tell. Um, and, uh, even though I, I, I had a, a like I was talking about, I, I uh, had a trans reader read the books for me and give me feedback on that character in particular. Um, but even with that, I still felt like, you know, that's, that's never going to ring true. And it's a story that's going to be better told by somebody else. Um, so I simply had, so, so the, the Nate's trans identity is a major part of his character. And I didn't want to exclude that, but that kind of, I guess the word we used before was sort of a struggle narrative um, is not, not for me to tell, if that makes sense. And I think it's important and it, it can be a fine line because you want to um, represent uh, different groups, different races, different ethnicities, um, different sexualities, different genders from your own. Um, and you don't wanna just write them as if it's uh, you know, a, a white person that you have just, uh, you know, you've, you're calling them black, but you're writing them like a white person. Um, you want to be truthful because, because our identities inform our experiences and they're going to shape your characters. Um, so finding that line can be difficult. Um, and it's important, like Hill was saying, to get perspectives from people who have lived those experiences before you put your work out into the world. That's, that's a great, great analysis. I wanted to, um, to, mention something that I do that I know um, is kind of important, especially since this is a group of, of a lot of writers. Um, Hypervisibility is something to be aware of. Uh, Hypervisibility is a form of violence that people in marginalized groups occasionally go through. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with when all of a sudden there was a lot more discussion in like the media about like autism, a lot more discussion in the media about like transgender people. That's hypervisibility. It's a very small community that everyone is suddenly seeing. And when all eyes are on a group, it is an emergency that work that is created about them that is about to be consumed by the vast general public is written with a very specific perspective, um, a perspective that is from the group that is being, that is dealing with the violence of hypervisibility because the details of what it is that their experience is, is um, it, it's, it's vital that it's accurate 
because some like in the past um, there have been periods of hyper hyper visibility. One of them, um, we black people go through a huge hyper visibility. There are way less of us than most people would assume. Like I think there's only twelve percent, and it's decreasing in the U.S. Um, when people write about those perspectives and they get like even small details wrong, everybody instantly believes that, that those details are correct because they're going through hyper visibility. So everybody sees them. So I actually have a policy where I, even though I feel like, I, I think I would do like a pretty okay job writing from the trans perspective because I'm intersex. So a lot of my experiences are almost like textbook experiences that trans women have gone through from small things like dealing with doctors all the way up through minute medical details of stuff that we've had to deal with. But I personally do not feel like I should be writing those characters during the violent period of hypervisibility that trans women are going through and trans men are going through right now. Um, and I think that um, making sure to pay attention to the environment with which you are putting out work, even when you feel like you're somebody who can create diverse, respectful content, even though you know I could do that thing where I have them input dialogue and stuff like that, like the core design of the story that I write, the integral aspects of the plot might be transphobic in a way that I don't have the perspective to test. So making sure that you pay attention to you know the environment with which you are producing your work is vitally important because it is absolutely a life or death situation when it comes to situations with hyper visibility. I think it's also, yes, totally, 100%. Um, and I think it's also important to be aware of where your work falls within the spectrum of work that's available. So it's very different to be writing, you know, the one book about asexual people that has been published by a traditional publisher in the last five years. And that's a very different experience than the scenario of writing a book about an asexual character that has been, um, that's one of like 50 books that have been published by a traditional publisher in the last five years, many of whom, most of, most of which are written by ace authors, for example. And so that's just like, you know, something to be aware of is, you know, not necessarily that I would say never write outside of your own expective, but as Kayla's saying, be aware of the environment in which you're creating your work and what other work is out there. And that uh, on a micro level, that, that idea can also be true within your own work. Um, and try to be aware uh, if you are writing uh, perspectives that are not your own, that uh, you are not just writing one character who is representative of that perspective. Um, so that that one character, uh, just for example, just from my work, my first series, um, uh, my, one of my main point of view characters is a black lesbian, which is not me. Um, so I have actually two, I introduced a second main point of view character as Black Lesbian. And there are multiple major secondary characters and a, a bunch of minor characters. Um, so that uh, that one character within my own work just doesn't bear the burden of representing all Black lesbians. Um, uh, yeah, I think you, you know what, 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 I, what I mean by that. Um, so that, that there's a, a diversity um, within my own writing, uh, in addition to hopefully across the industry. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's all uh, super helpful. Um, anybody else on that question? Okay. All right, so our, our next question is about time travel, um, which might be a question for Nairi, but uh, maybe others have uh, fabulous thoughts on time travel as well. So time travel sits at the exciting crossroads of fantasy, sci-fi, and historical fiction. How do you use time period to place queer characters within or outside of history? So this is, I, I really like this question because it rather central to Grey Dawn, was, uh, so I have these two main characters. One of them is a modern day uh, trans lesbian and the other one is a time traveling uh, cis lesbian from the 1860s. 
And so Chloe, my time traveling 1860s character, um, is uh, it, her experience finding herself in the 21st century and seeing how much has changed and how much hasn't. Um, one, of the, one of the important story threads for her is finding out that there's a thing that I am and there's, there are words for it. <laughs> and they're different than the words that used to be used when I, back in the old days. Um, yeah, the, the term lesbian, as I understand in modern usage only dates to the 1870s. Um, you know, and if she fell through time from July, 1863, uh, you know, that's not how she would parse her identity, but, you know, her sort of uh, learning what's different and what isn't uh, in that regard, I feel like was a good way for me to be able to sketch out that terms change, you know, even, even if the things that we are don't necessarily change, you know, there have always been queer people throughout history. The, the, the language that we use to parse that changes and the ways that people um, embody it and, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and live it, uh, you know, may look different, in different at different periods in history. Um, you know, so I was, able to, I was able to juxtapose her perspective as a out of time learning to adapt 19th century lesbian, cis lesbian with Lee's uh, 21st century trans lesbian lived experience um, in, uh, you know, in, in, in urban uh, uh, Philadelphia. Um, and this is, this is actually related to something that I like to do with pretty much everything that I write, uh, which is I try to teach through my fiction. You know, I'm very passionate about bringing things to people's attention and helping them, helping them learn to be aware of things that otherwise escape their notice through fiction, because I think that that's a better way of making it stick. Um, you know, I, call, I, I used to call it baking kale into the brownies. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, there's a lot in Grey Dawn that deals with very real 19th century Philadelphia uh, uh, abolitionist activity. Um, and uh, so I've had readers who have come to be surprised that, oh, I didn't know, say, for instance, I didn't know William Still was a real person in, in Philadelphia in the 1860s. I thought you made, I, th I, thought you, that, I thought that was one of your characters. Like, no, he was real. You can read his memoir. You can visit his, you could visit his house. Um, uh, so, so just broadly, uh, broadly, I, I think that, I think that time travel, is a good edu can be a good educational tool, but also on queer issues specifically, I think it's a it's a good way of uh, it can be a good way of of of, uh, of exploring what changes, what doesn't, what do we take for granted that isn't fixed. Um, in my next project, um, which is called Homeward Stars, I have a 22nd century lesbian who is uh, suddenly realizes that she can see the ghosts of her ancestors. Uh, like going all the way back to the early 19th century. And they're all trying to match her with the woman that she, she has a crush on. Um, but uh, having, you know, this hypothetical future perspective also is something I'm enjoying writing now of how might a future person, a future queer person parse their identity and how would they view us today and people going all the way back. Um, you know, what would that, what would that look like? Uh, how would that be, how would that be articulated? Um, and also just as a change from the usual, uh, people from the past don't, won't necessarily get it. Like, no, she's talking to these people and they all know that she's trans and they all know that she's lesbian. And that, that that's, that's inconsequential. We're here to make sure that you're happy. She's into you, you know, um, so yeah, a little bit roundabout answer there, but, uh, but I hope that that, uh, I hope that, 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 uh, that expresses things, uh, uh, at least a little decently there. I love that answer. I'm ex so excited to read your book. So thank you for that. Yeah. I uh, love, um, sorry. Um, I love what you're saying about, um, you know, this character who is a historical lesbian, but just doesn't have the modern language to 
describe herself. And I think that um, a fallacy that a lot of people fall into is thinking that like queer people were invented in the last 50 years. And that's simply not true. You know, there have been queer people throughout history. As long as there have been people, there have been queer people. Just, you know, the ways in which, like the words that we used and and the ways in which it was discussed, you know, might have been different, but they were always there. So I feel like, you know, I feel like you're doing such a great job at educating people about that while writing a great story and that people who are like hesitant about, oh, should I include this queer person in my historical whatever? Like, is that accurate and we can discuss you know the fallacy of accuracy also but that's a dis different discussion um should not be concerned about that because yes they were there they always have been yeah that was actually something that that was actually something another point of people coming readers coming to me surprised was um you know i have these i have people in the supporting cast uh, who chloe meets during her time in the union army um who are what we would now call trans men. Um, and I get these I get these surprised readers like, are, were there really trans masculine people in the Union Army? And I <laughs> let me tell you about Albert DJ Cashier. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, of course there were, of course there were. Um, it's just, it's just not a narrative. These are not narratives that that are uh, you know commonly explored or commonly taught. Uh, so I think this is, yeah, this is a good way of teaching them. Excellent, so we do have some more questions and we also have uh, questions in the chat box that we can at any point entertain if people would like to, but um, you know, this conversation has been so exciting and, you know, it's very clear that authors like all of you are on the cutting edge of what the future of this genre, right, and the style of writing is going to be. So we would love to give everyone an opportunity to talk about what's coming next for you. Uh, so please, um, at, you know, in whatever order, if you'd like to tell us what's next for you in terms of your writing, we're excited. first. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a book uh, coming out in June called Darling. It is a Peter Pan um, reboot that's uh, set in the modern day. It is an ensemble cast, cast book, like a majority of um, my works, and it's, it's very much about Peter Pan being a serial killer. So, <laughs> because he's a serial killer in the original book and no one likes to talk about it and I'm upset about that. Um, and then um, I have another book that um, is actually due in a couple of months. Um, it is a train heist uh, where a bunch of girls in their town decide to rob this like rich person Christmas train that goes through their town that actually exists. It goes from Chicago to New York. Um, and they just go on it to just kind of like steal the cash box and jump off and whatever. And when they get in the train, it's being robbed by adults. So now the new goal is to get off the train because they're like, we don't have any weapons, we're all 17. And they're like, you know, standing there with, you know, their actual weapons. And then I have a book that I am currently selling that I feel um, very strongly about and it's called Icarus. And it is a book about um, a intersex romance, but it's also like an art heist. And it's about like Hellenistic beauty ideals and um, kind of like exploring the like original understanding of hermaphroditism. And I am hoping very strongly that Macmillan will buy it. So that's what's coming up next. I just wanna be like, oh my gosh, like I need these books right now. <laughs> um, ah. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, I hope that book sells. I want to read it. Um, okay. So my next book upcoming is called Briar Girls. It's coming this November and it is a queer YA fantasy, very dark, very bloody about a girl who was cursed by a witch uh, such that she cannot touch anyone uh, because when she does, they die. 
And she always thought, you know, there's no way to get it out, out of this. There's no magic in this world, except for, you know, I've been cursed, like I can't do anything until one day um, this girl appears and she's like, hmm, I think maybe you're wrong about there being no other magic in the world. Maybe there is something that you can do about this curse. Maybe you should come with me and find out. And there are family secrets, generational trauma, creepy forests, creepy dragons, creepy merfolk, lots of creepy stuff. <laughs> and I'm very excited about it. Um, so my, uh, my next book, my current work in progress, I'm still pretty early on the writing of it. Um, I tend to have a lot of humor in my books and I'm leaning into that uh, in this one and just having fun with it. It's, um, and also drawing, I, I come from a theater background, so uh, that finds its way into a lot of my books and especially in this one. So it's uh, a genre I sort of read that's been around a while that I recently discovered uh, called the lit RPG. Um, so I'm playing with that and it's a, a gay Broadway chorus boy gets plastered drunk after his uh, closing, after his show closes too early and wakes up in a fantasy world that seems to be dictated by uh, the rules for online role-playing games. Um, so it just follows him and him trying to figure out if this is real and what's going on and being forced into finishing these quests and side quests for a greater purpose that'll be revealed later in the series. But mostly it's a chance for me to just have fun and write jokes about Broadway musicals. Um, the paperback edition of The Fascinators comes out in May and has a prequel short story um, set a year before the events of the book. So if you are thinking about buying it, maybe wait until <laughs> May and you'll have the complete um, story. That was one of the few things I was able to finish last year. Um, but the next book I'm working on um, is for younger readers and um, I Have Crohn's Disease. It is about um, a boy with Crohn's disease who is also gay um, and navigating the feelings of monstrousness that come with being both of those things and being feeling a little bit at war with your body and also right now features some online RPG elements. I was a big gamer growing up and um, realized that part of what drew me to games was being disembodied um, and, and having that chance to, um, you know, just be your mind on the internet. So that's what the book is exploring. So um, my, um, I mentioned a little while ago, my next project is called Homeward Stars. It's a trans lesbian rom-com set in 22nd century New England between Boston and a town called Brunswick, Maine. Um, and it's about a trans woman uh, who, fall, who falls in love with another trans woman uh, and in the process uh, also has to confront the ghosts of her ancestors who are all trying to match her up with this woman that she's crushing on. Um, and so facing uh, not only the literal ghosts of the past, but also the figurative ghosts of a hometown in Maine that she left uh, under adverse circumstances and uh, finding the courage to take another leap of faith to come back to it and reclaim it and make it her own because there may be, there are more people there who will have her back than she thinks there are. Um, beyond that, I have another project in development. It's very, it's very early. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for the, for the link in the chat. Um, early content for this, this project and bonus content for Grey Dawn lives on my Patreon, so. Uh, but uh, beyond this, I have another project down the road. Uh, for the first time, I want to. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in writing something from my own Armenian diaspora experience uh, because I've been exploring some of the uh, some, some of the mythos, some of the folklore uh, uh, that particularly reads as queer. Um, and I wanted to think like, okay, what if I wrote? a uh, middle-aged Armenian American trans woman who suddenly realizes she's the heir of the, the heir of, of, um, of, the, of the deity of the Hakan, the fire god, and has to go on with life being a single mom in 21st century, uh, you know, uh, New York. Uh, 
Uh, you know, how do I, how does she how does she deal with that? Uh, what does that look like on a day to day basis? Something that's very important to me as an author in general is, you know, I really like having the fantastical and the supernatural and the magical in my stories. But I really it really means a lot to me uh, to have it not just be the realm of the powerful, but have it woven in in the mundane. You know, life has to go on. Some of my favorite, some of my favorite fictional narratives in this regard also are just stories like it, there was this anime called Kamichu where a junior high school girl becomes a god, but still has to go to school tomorrow. What does that look like? Um, so I'm going to be I'm going to be exploring that down the down the road with this project I've, that I've, I've given the working title of Broadway Demons. So that's what's coming for me. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank you to Briar for putting all the information here in the chat about ways that you can access our author's books. Um, and also a reminder that it is still Pit Day of Giving. It's Pit Day of Giving all day. So if you want to contribute to the fund, there is a link there for you. Um, it's also actually a Pit Self-Care Day, which is exciting. We might have some students here who are doing self-care by tuning into our fabulous authors. Um, I think maybe sort of in the spirit of that, we can, you know, sort of lean into some optimism that might be like, you know, your hope for the genre or, you know, and or um, any advice that you might have for people who are uh, potentially getting into it or writers uh, who are struggling. So this is just kind of a combination of things that I pulled together from chat box and our previous questions, but, you know, uh, things that you would like to see in the genre um, and or advice that you have for writers who are either new or struggling. I think the question that I get a lot um, on these panels is about how to actually like finish a book. <laughs> Because I have like severe ADHD and that, that is an uphill battle for me. Um, and I, one of the ways that it has really made it a lot easier for me to get as much um, work done as I do and to produce as many projects as quickly as I do um, is to be aggressively organized in a way that is not at all a part of my character. Like it is maximum type A and I'm like type E to the point of detriment. So, like my grades were bad <laughs> in school. But um, so what I do is I actually uh, write um, these really detailed outlines. I write three of them. I do one that is just like an outline of the plot, super easy, you know, cut and dry. One that is a outline of the character development of the characters that I'm writing, how they're going to change, kind of like analysis about their personal growth. And then I have a third one, and it is what I want the reader to experience while reading the book. And um, then when it's time for me to write it, I take the original just like plot outline and stuff like that, break it down into chapters and then just write what's in each chapter. I just show up at you know work and write what's there. And I know exactly what's coming next. I don't have the opportunity to fall out of love with my work or to write myself into corners or to feel like my pacing is weird because the pacing has already been pre-approved and looked at and whatever my editor is like, go write that. <laughs> And um, also when I get to a point where I'm like, I don't know if I know this character as well, I could just turn to the outline about what, you know, where they're supposed to be going emotionally and it's already there because I wrote it two months ago. And I'm like, ah, oh, there we go, put myself back on track and then go back to, you know, the original outline. And then when the book is finished, I read through the book and then I read through what I want my reader to feel. And if some of the moments don't hit as tense or as romantic or as much, you know, space or something like that. I'll just fine tune little details and then there we go. A work that doesn't need that much structural engineering by the editing department of Macmillan. And I feel like that really, really helps for somebody who doesn't have those like internal organizational skills to create that, you know, that for themselves. And I think that a lot of the time when you're writing, um, there's so many other things going on with you emotionally, like whether or not your work is worth it. That's like a huge thing. Whether or not you, you know, should be writing this story or that story, whether or not, you know, your work is of a quality that's, you know, worth being looked at by somebody who would consider it to be, you know, viable product. Um, that really helps give you the space and time to think about those things as opposed to thinking about the other technical issues. And then the other thing that I think is really important about um, being like an LGBTQ writer is the understanding that when you are writing something, a lot of the times you feel feelings about it that are like negative, 
you know, like you're like, oh, this story is too, too much exposure. It's not good enough. It's this, it's that. When you're a marginalized person, you fill your head with these things because they are things that have been proven to you or told to you by the environment with which you are growing. So the, my work isn't worth it. Nobody wants to hear about my story. You know, all of that. Those are things that we take in and those are things that fester inside of us. I've found it to be very, very helpful to view your work as a product and to take the experience of, I don't like this book, whatever. If I give it to somebody and they're like, this is the best thing ever. doesn't matter what I feel. It's the best thing ever. And I feel like that is something that really, really makes it easier to kind of give your work to other people and to share your stuff with other people. Um, and also looking back at what has been done before is also really helpful as well, because sometimes, you know, in the past, it wasn't necessarily taken in by traditional publishing. And when you read about other people who are writing from an LGBT perspective, who were like, you know what? I'm going to self-publish. I'm going to write scenes. I'm going to write, you know, little pamphlets and share it only in my community. That really, at least for me, gives me the strength to, you know, punch forward and being like, you know, these people sacrificed. Now it's my turn to make sure that, you know, I can keep that momentum going and keep that, you know, going forward and stuff. Even if I feel like, oh, I don't know if this is good enough. It doesn't matter. We need to make sure that it, you know, has a chance that, people who are in those upper echelons of publishing have the opportunity to look at it and decide ethically whether they want to be a good person and allow a quality work that is marginalized to go through or if they're going to continue with the history of oppression. So that's what I do. I um I first so just your outlining I do virtually the same thing. It is incredibly great for me that level of organization I need it. Um, and just a, a, a just a very small tip. Um, I hope you can hear me. My radiator is blasting like a jet engine. So I hope I'm still audible. Um, I think I saw someone in the Q and A saying they're having some trouble with just sitting down to write because of stress um, or other issues you may be going through. That was me, particularly when I started my first book. I was in a very stressful place and in a very uh, a dark place of self loathing. Um, and I, I for six months of writing, I probably got three chapters out, and I was beating myself up for it. What I started doing on a, a tip from a friend. Um, and this sounds very silly and simple is I would just set a timer for 15 minutes every day. Um, and that was my 15 minutes to just sit and write, or it was writing time where I didn't do anything else. And if I did nothing but sit and stare at the computer, um, that I, then I had done it for the day. And of course, uh, in many days I would write on and on, but if I did nothing but 50 minutes and I wrote one idea or I wrote nothing, um, what it did was it let me not beat myself up anymore because that was my goal for the day. It's only 15 minutes. And no matter how I was feeling, I could sit down for 15 minutes. And if I was waiting for that timer to get off, to go off so I could get up and go, that was fine. Uh, and then I wrote the rest of the first draft in the next six months doing that. I was going to say much the same thing, except I was going to be like five minutes, set a five minute timer. <laughs> um, I struggle with feeling like, oh, like if I'm not writing 5,000 words a day, I'm failing, you know, like if I'm not making ridiculous goals and meeting them, then, you know, I can't call myself a writer. And that's, that's all nonsense. Um, I like, it's so important as Brian was saying to have like very small manageable goals that, you know, that they're not nonsense goals, like they're real and they matter. And um, something that I would say also is that sometimes I find that when I'm starting to write, I have like this backlog of like, oh, bad feelings around writing, like guilt that I haven't been writing. Like, uh, you know, as Kayla was saying, like, is this work any good? Do I matter? Blah, blah, blah. And sometimes what I find helpful is, you know, during a little, you know, five minute, 15 minute spurt when I'm just looking at a blank page or looking at the computer, just to, like write whatever, just like word vomit, like, oh, like I can't write anything. I don't feel great today. I stubbed my toe. It hurts. And to me, the act of just writing anything, not even stuff on the story I'm working on, 
sort of like unlocks a little bit and it's like okay like this is what writing feels like and it's you know the added benefit of sort of like purging some of those unhelpful feelings and then once I'm done with that then I'm like oh like maybe I'll write a sentence on this like maybe I find this fun like maybe I'll like explore and play a little in here I've also heard the suggestion like literally three sentences a day um and anyone can sit down and just write three sentences, even if it's just like, you know, John went to sit at the window, it was raining outside, he had a cup of tea. And often you'll find that once you write those, they'll be like, oh, maybe I'll write sentence number four. And even if you don't, you've still written three sentences that you wouldn't have otherwise. I, I have done all of these tips. I've done the timer, I like a little sand timer and the outlining. And the, the one thing I would add is finding your community of people who are rooting for you. And if you can, I, I in the pandemic, um, started a, a writing group with two friends and we don't actually share what we're writing. We just check in with one another at the end of each week and say, how did you do if you weren't able to get anything done? you know, how are you feeling? Like just having, knowing that you have people who are excited for you to write and that you, you know, I, accountability feels like a big word for it, but, but that there are people who care that how you did that week. And it's okay if you didn't get anything done that week, but you know, they're excited for you if you did. I, I have found that just having that sort of like community support and checking in with your friends to say, how did your writing go this week? Um, keeps it from feeling as isolating because when you're writing a, you know, <laughs> very long book it can be a very isolating process and especially this past year where I haven't been able to go to coffee shops where I normally like to do my writing because I can be reminded that other people exist at the same time that I'm writing um, doing it in an office alone like having other people to check in has been crucial so I again I've <laughs> a lot of this resonates with me too um, and and I can vouch for it uh, for me, you know, as also as someone with ADHD, uh, you know, the, this question of how do you actually get things done um, is, you know, life and death sometimes. Um, but, you know, now having written a dissertation and having written a novel, um, the thing that helped with both was that aggressive, that aggressive outlining and organization, but as a framework to allow for writing the chapters out of order because my attention can't always go in a line. Sometimes I really want to write the last chapter. So let's write the last chapter, jump back and write another one. Um, and that's how I got, yeah, that's how I got my dissertation done. That's how I got this book done. That's how I'm getting, you know, Homeward Stars done. Um, having that flexibility, you know, because I have that clear outline of this, 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 then this in this, general shape, um, you know, really helps me uh, outmaneuver the ADHD and be able to actually get things done. Um, you know, and, and it's, and it's, it, it's really, it's, it's paying off um, that, that, that aggressive attention to, to organization. So. So much gratitude for our panelists today. I think it's very clear that you have inspired uh, the people here to read. So once again, um, all of these folks' books are available. Um, we do have a selection of books that are available at the University Store on 5th. Um, but with these final comments, you've inspired all of us to write, right? And to do our part in uh, diversifying the voices of fiction. So, so much gratitude for you for being here. I am delighted to have gotten to know all of you and to get to know your work. Uh, better. So thank you. And um, a final reminder about the LGBTQA plus uh, research and outreach endowed fund. Uh, Briar has been popping that in the chat box. And I do hope that our panelists see uh, some of the really meaningful gratitude that they got in the chat box as well. So um, yeah, thanks for being here, everybody. And, and uh, thanks for joining us for to our attendees. And please enjoy self care day. Be good to yourselves. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.